All right. Welcome, everyone, to Student 9 this evening. Uh, if it's your first time here, we're glad that you're here. If uh, you've been coming back over and over again, it's good to see familiar faces. You know, I think one thing we've learned over the past few years is we shouldn't take meetings like this for granted because we don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what tomorrow brings. And, you know, I just like looking at you guys' faces. It kind of makes me feel younger. So uh, thank you all for coming out in this evening. Uh, we're taking a break from our series on the Apostle Paul and talking about Good Friday. Good Friday is, um, is a special, special event in the life of any Christian. And the first question that comes to our minds usually is, what's so good about Good Friday? What's so good about a day when Jesus, the Son of God, died? And we're going to get into a little bit of that tonight. But I want to remind everyone that we're still in what we call Passion Week, or the last week of Jesus' life on earth, where on Sunday we celebrate Palm Sunday, and he came in uh, triumphantly, and they lay down palm leaves before him and threw their cloaks down and said, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yesterday, if you came to church, uh, we had not just a communion, but we celebrated the Last Supper of Jesus Christ with his disciples on the Jewish festival of the Passover. And the Passover was a day that the Jewish people remembered how God delivered them from slavery, from the Egyptians. If you remember, before God sent the last plague to the Egyptians, he told Moses, tell the Israelites to take a lamb, take the blood from the lamb, and put it over the doorposts of their home. And then I will go through, and whoever does not have the blood of the lamb over the, over the doorpost, um, I will kill their firstborn son. I will enter that home and kill their firstborn son. And so those that had the blood over them, over the house, the angel of the Lord passed over their house. So that's where the Passover comes from. They pass over them. And it wasn't because they were more worthy than anybody else. It wasn't because they did anything better to deserve the mercy of God. It's simply because there was blood. It's simply because at that moment there was a price that was paid. And it was good news for whoever had blood on their doorpost. And that's what's good about Good Friday. Not because Jesus suffered, but the result of his suffering. Not because of his agony and the sin that was laid upon him, but because of the good news that that brought for everybody on the face of the planet. And when Jesus was talking to his disciples on that last night, you know, he was speaking to them one last time about the good news that was almost there, how everything was almost there, how for the past few thousand years, things had been building up to this moment. He was trying to get them to understand, and he even told them plenty of times that the Son of Man has to die, and on the third day he will rise again. But they still kind of veiled and kind of foggy about what exactly would happen. And he was saying, the problem will soon be fixed. The problem will soon be fixed, and I will be the one to handle it. So, for thousands of years, there was a problem. There was this stubborn thing called sin. And if you're listening to this on the podcast later on, um, there's a nail stuck here in a few two-by-fours. And this nail is very stubborn. It's not going anywhere. I could try to push it down with my hand to get rid of it. Um, I could try to move it around, but it's not going anywhere. I don't have the right tools for the job. And so what God had done a few thousand years earlier is he gave a set of tools, a copy of the right tools to Moses. He gave the law. And he said, there's this problem right here. There's sin. And I have a plan to get rid of it, but not yet. Until then, here are some tools that you're going to have to use as a remembrance of what's to come. And so he gave them a set of tools. And, you know, I have here my, um, my little daughter's toolkit, and she loves this thing. She, I mean, she goes around the house and fixes things, right? Just bangs on things as hard as she possibly can. So he gave them some tools. And here's a hammer, but it's a plastic hammer. And he said, we're going to institute a festival a day where there's going to be copies of things that are to come. It's going to be a shadow of things to come. And it's going to look something like this. Okay?
It's going to look something like that. Now, you can try to bang that nail with a plastic hammer as much as you, as you want, but it's not going to do anything to it. You can try with all your might to uh, move it around, but you don't have the right tool. You don't have the right skill set. Now, I'm not going to sit here and bang as hard as I can because I might break it and then my little girl will cry. So, this is a representation of the tool that God gave to the Israelites thousands of years before Jesus came to earth. He gave them the law. He gave them ceremonial things to do. Everything they did was a symbol of what was to come. Every sacrifice they did, every slaughtering of an animal, every purification rite was a symbol of what was to come. But he gave them a set of tools to get them to realize that they can't do it on their own. That they can't do it with the tools that they currently have. And for thousands of years, they tried to fix that problem of sin. Not just the Israelites, but humanity. Humanity tried to come in, different religions, different philosophies, different mindsets. And they had this problem. Maybe they didn't call it sin. But some of them had a problem of maybe trying to find purpose in life. Trying to fulfill a hole in their spiritual heart. Ecclesiastes says that God put eternity into the heart of man. Meaning, we as humans are constantly unfulfilled in this earth. We truly, when you dig down to it, we can never be fully fulfilled because there is a problem. There is a problem, and people try to reconcile it with all kinds of tools. This is the tool that looks like what was to come, but people came with different religions and took out their little tool belt. Okay, this is just adorable, this little tool belt, I love it. With a little tool belt, and try to put all different kinds of tools in it, right? That doesn't work. Came out with other tools, you know, well, uh, maybe Islam, maybe uh, Buddhism, right? That doesn't work. You're not fixing the problem. Well, maybe with philosophies and modernism and, uh, you know, uh, postmodernism. That doesn't really work, right? This is a nail, not a screw. Doesn't work. We don't have the right tools to deal with the big problem in our lives. And all of us have that problem. Romans says that we are, we're enemies of God, that we all fell short of his glory. That since the fall of man into sin, there has been this problem. There has been this issue. Still, even after the fall, God did not abandon his people. Again, he gave them a symbol of what was to come. He gave them a copy of what was to come. So if you have your scriptures, we're going to get into the word tonight and talk a little bit more about what the right tool looks like. So open up your scriptures, and I, I hope you have it with you, to Hebrews chapter 9. The book of Hebrews, by the way, um, if you really want to understand the connection between Judaism and Christianity and uh, the ceremonies and the festivals and what sacrifice meant, please read this book. It talks about Jesus. It talks about him being greater than anything that, that came before. So this is an amazing book, and today we're going to look at it just a little bit in the time that we have, starting in chapter 9. And I'm not going to read all these verses, but the context is verses 1 through 10. And in here, the author is saying that there was a time when God gave the law to Moses, and he gave him certain things that they had to do on the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, if, if you speak Hebrew. The Day of Atonement was a day when the high priest, and back when it was with Moses, it was Aaron, when Aaron would go and he would try to atone for the sins of Israel, for the nation as a whole, for those unrealized sins, not even the ones that were fulfilled, but the ones that people had no idea about, the unrealized sins. And so in these verses, it talks about uh, the tabernacle, which was... Uh, a place where there were three main sections to it. There was the outer court, and then there was the holy place, which was inside of a tent. And then even deeper inside that tent was the holy of holies. And in that holy of holies was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was this uh, beautiful uh, case or box, if you will, that had two cherubim angels with their wings spread over the mercy seat. And inside that Ark, inside that, that trunk, that case, 
were three things. There was a golden jar of manna, there was the budded rose of Aaron, and there were the stone tablets that had the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses. And once a year, what this high priest would do, and it describes it here more in detail, is he would cleanse himself ceremoniously, go in there, and using blood, he would sprinkle it on the Holy of Holies and intercede for the people and ask for the forgiveness of sins. And this will go on year after year after year after year. And what happened over time was instead of people seeing that, hey, we've been doing this for thousands of years and this hasn't been working. Like that priest goes in there every single year and it works for a little bit, but doesn't solve the problem. We pray and we confess our sins, but it's not working. And God, through the course of history, gave signs and prophecies of what was to come. And he would give little hints. He would say that, I will write my law on their hearts. There's going to be someone that comes and suffers for all of humanity. And their blood and by his stripes, they will be healed and forgiven. And he was telling the people this. But over time, humans as, as we are, we get stubborn and we get stuck in our ways. And they tried to fix it themselves. And they came with their tools. And by the time Jesus came around, this was salvation for them. This is what they had to do. And they kept hitting it and hitting it and hitting it. And nothing would change. What kind of copies of tools do we use in our lives? When we try to fix things, when we try to save ourselves, when we try to pull ourselves up, what do we use? In this day and age, you can spend hours and days online just looking at different ways to motivate yourself, different ways to clean your conscience, different ways to um, fulfill, try to fulfill that hole in your life, maybe through charity, maybe through acts of good service. Or unfortunately, for some people, maybe it's just coming to church week after week after week and trying to do something good to try to earn God's favor. But this is what your tool looks like. It's a plastic hammer against a nail, against reality, against the problem of sin. And we try to use this to fulfill our lives, and we can't. It's impossible. The more we try, the more frustrated we get, the more frustrated we get, the deeper we get into ourselves, and the deeper we get into ourselves, we come to a point where we just give up. And we say, if this is what Christianity is, like hasta poca inza, I'm done. The problem is, that's not what Christianity is. That's not what God has commanded us to do. But if we try to do it, we get frustrated and we stop. And countless lives and millions of people, Christians even around the world, that don't understand using the right tools in their life, give up and fall short. Never realize the plan that God truly has for them. Because they try to use their own tools. They use the philosophies of the world. We use the slogans of the world. And we don't really look at the core problem. Now, I want to mention this before we go on. The law that God gave to the Israelites and the things that he had them do for that day of atonement was not bad. It was just a symbol of what was to come. Even Paul says, the law is not bad. It just showed you that you couldn't do it by yourself. It just showed you that the tools that you have are inadequate. So we're not disparaging on what they were doing. They were commanded to do so, but they were doing so religiously and not from the right heart, not from the right spirit. They were living the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. And when Jesus came in those days, he, he chastised the religious leaders and says, you brood of vipers, you whitewashed tombs. There's people dying all around you, and you're here with your plastic cameras trying to fix a problem. That's the biggest issue that Jesus had. Hebrews 9, verse 23, we'll read this real quick. Hebrews 9, 23. Here's where it changes. It says that, Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. Okay, so this wasn't bad what they were doing. It was a symbol. It was a copy of what was real. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. With better sacrifices than these. There's something greater to come. I want to take us through 
what the Day of Atonement would look like. What would look like when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and atone for the sins of the nation? Because this is what we're talking about today. We're talking about the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus. Back in the time of Moses, Aaron was to change his normal clothes, his normal priestly garments, and put on special ones. He took the necessary sacrificial animals, a bull, two male goats, two rams. He slaughtered the bull for his own sin offering. And before entering the Holy of Holies with the blood of the bull, Aaron had to create a cloud of incense, meaning he would create a lot of smoke so that as he went into the Holy of Holies, it would sort of veil the pure presence of God from him. Because if he saw it, he would die. He would have to just create incense and smoke and go in that direction. Aaron took some of the blood from the bull and sprinkled it on the mercy seat seven times. And then they would cast lots or pull straws or dice, whatever, for the two goats to determine which one will be slaughtered and which one will be driven away. We'll talk about that later. The goat for the slaughter, the goat of the people's sin offering was sacrificed and his blood was taken into the holy of holies and applied to the mercy seat. Cleansing would be made for the holy place. Next, outside the tent, Aaron was to take atonement for the altar of burnt offering. Now, the second goat would be used as a scapegoat in which he would lay his hands on the goat and symbolically rest all the sins of the people onto the goat, and the goat would be sent away. He then entered the tent of meeting, removed his linen garments, washed and put on his normal priestly garments, and then the burnt offering of rams, and then the earlier sacrifices of the bull and the goat were completed. And then those who had been rendered unclean by handling the animals will go and clean themselves as well. I don't know if you know this, but there's a lot of blood involved. And I don't know if you're squeamish or not, but there was a ton of blood involved. I had a manager one time who said um, um, he found out later in life when, his, when one of his daughters got sick, and she well, got sick when she fell and scraped herself and started bleeding, and he fainted right away. And it turns out he has a condition where if he like sees blood or talks about blood, he like passes out. And he's like, well, that made me feel like a good dad. You know, your kid's in danger and you pass out. Um, so if you're squeamish or if anything, like, uh, you know, I'll try not to talk about it too much, but it is important because it's part of the context here. It, it really is. It's really, really important because scripture says that there is life in blood, right? There's life in blood. So that's a big thing that we're going to talk about tonight. And then back in Hebrews 9.11, so this was the process, Hebrews 9.11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest, not Aaron. Aaron was, I'm not going to call Aaron a tool, but he was using the tools, right? Using the tools. But Jesus came with the real tools. As a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Aaron was a sinner. He was a human. He not only had the sin from his forefather Adam, that spiritual uh, uh, cancer of the DNA that is inside every single one of us from when we were born. In, in our spiritual DNA, we have that sin from our forefather, Adam and Eve. But also the sins of disobedience, of active disobedience towards God. He was a sinner. If you remember when when Moses was on the mountain receiving the commandments from God, he what? He helped the people build a golden calf. And he lived. Jesus was and is sinless. He's a greater high priest. He had greater authority. Jesus was born of a virgin. That's why that's important. He didn't have that spiritual DNA from Adam all the way down to himself. He was born of a virgin, and while he lived, he lived completely blameless and innocent. He did not sin. He was perfect. He was holy and undefiled and never broke any of the laws. Jesus was a greater high priest. Jesus had the right tools for the job. He showed what was to be done. And Aaron could only enter the Holy of Holies once a year. And even so, when he did, they would actually wrap a rope around him because in case he died before the presence of God, they could pull him out. And even when he went in, it was only after all that 
blood and all the sacrifices and the incense and the smokes and everything that was required before you could even enter there. He could only enter there and even then once a year and pray to God that he would survive. Jesus entered the real tabernacle, the real Holy of Holies, not the one made by people, not the one made by hands, but the eternal one. He entered into the presence of the Father. And by his blood, he offered that price for sin. Not through the sprinkling of any other animal, but through his own blood. He was the real thing, not the copy. Aaron entered the tabernacle only after the involuntary slaughter of animals. None of those goats or bulls or any of those animals came up and said, I want to sacrifice myself for the sins of Israel. None of them did. It was involuntary. The priest took them or the people brought them, and those poor things had to be laid on top of an altar and whoosh, dead. Blood poured out. They had to bring them, sprinkle on the altar, sprinkle on whatever else. I mean, it was, it was just, it was an involuntary slaughter. Jesus went involuntarily. He knew it was the will of the Father, and he chose to do so. You guys remember when he was before Pontius Pilate? How he said, is he a king? And Jesus said, you have said so. When he, was, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and Peter cut the ear off Malchus and Jesus took the ear and placed it back and said, Peter, don't you think I could call a host of angels right now? Don't you think if I really wanted to get out of this, me as a king, as God, I could do so? He chose to do it. That's why he's the greater, the greater priest. That's why he's the real thing. Because even if a human decided to go voluntarily, it wouldn't have mattered. Inside that, that blood, that, that spiritual DNA, there was sin. And to God that was defiled. And it could only bring about a temporary forgiveness. A temporary appeasement of God's wrath over the people. He entered the Holy of Holies by his own voluntary sacrifice. Because Jesus did this, because he was the real thing, we have benefits from that. That's what we call a Good Friday. Because before that, we could only hope, as the Israelites did, that God's wrath would be appeased for another year. But because he did this, we have a few things that we can benefit from. Hebrews 9, verse 12 through 14. He entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The first thing that this does it takes care of that conscience. It helps us with that problem that every single person on earth faces, their conscience. Conscience is a nosy neighbor. Um, if you guys remember that show, it was quite a while back, Home Improvement with Tim Allen, uh, where he has that neighbor that's on his fence who always kind of pokes over, but you only ever see from his nose up. And he kind of comes up and he says, howdy, neighbor. He's always there. He's always talking to him. He's giving him advice. But he's always there. He's like that nosy neighbor that kind of looks in. That's how our conscience is. We can try to ignore it. We can try to build taller fences. But it always finds a way back into our conscience or back into our reality. It always finds a way to say, hey, what are you doing? Hey, do you really feel good about that? Hey. I think you should face this problem head on and deal with it. But unfortunately, the more we try to distance ourselves from our God-given conscience, the more we try to manage it with other things, and we turn to addictions, and we turn to philosophies, and we turn, as some people around the world do, to self-mutilation. 
to try to appease that conscience to say, no, I can still do good things. I am a good person. That conscience, that inner voice, that eternity that's put in our heart says, but what about after this life? What then? What's going to happen then? You know that something is not right. And humans at a fundamental level live off of, of a standard law of a moral code. And by the way, if you haven't read Mere Christianity, the first few chapters of it covers it. It, it really lays it out simply. But it says that we all live by this basic universal code, whether we realize it or not. And it picks and it chooses us, and we can't get rid of it. We turn to violence, immorality, greed to try to cover up and hush up that conscience, that voice. Adam and Eve had a guilty conscience when they sinned, and they tried to cover themselves up with leaves because they were ashamed of themselves. They tried to cover up their nakedness and pretend like nothing happened. But then God came. And not only did he say, what have you done? But he provided a temporary covering for them through the sacrifice of an animal, the killing of an animal to give them clothes, to provide a temporary covering. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, his blood gave us a permanent covering. His blood helped with that problem of the pesky conscience as reminding us that something's not right, that we're not right with God, that we're not right with a higher power, with a higher authority. Jesus solved that problem. No animal's blood could solve that problem. No blood, nothing that they would try to do. No plastic hammers would ever solve that problem. The cleansing of our conscience comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. The cleansing of our conscience also makes us want to serve God. It says in verse 14 at the end, it makes us want to go from our dead works to serve the living God. Maybe you've had a season or a time in your life where you're just not serving God. You're just living for yourself. You're doing the routines, you're doing the habits, you're coming to church, you're playing in the band, whatever, but you're, you know you're not really serving God because your heart's not in it. What's your conscience telling you? What's the Holy Spirit as Christians? What's the Holy Spirit saying to you? Because if we are in our ways, if we're trying to build up those fences, we alienate ourselves from God even further. And we find that we serve him by motion only and go through the habits with our plastic tools there's no joy, there's no power, there's no peace. But thank God that we do have a conscience and thank God that there is a Holy Spirit that pushes on that and that kind of presses on that and doesn't leave us alone. Because if God didn't love us, if he didn't love you, he would leave you alone. He would say, I'm not sending you to hell, I'm letting you go in the direction that you're going, which is already towards hell. And God would stay out of our lives and he wouldn't have interfered with Adam and Eve, he would have cast him out of the garden of Eve and started somewhere else or done something else. But God had a plan. And God created us with that conscience. And gave us as Christians the Holy Spirit to remind us that we need to keep our conscience clean. That we need to come before God. And we mess up. We make mistakes. We still sin. But when that conscience, when that spirit talks and reminds us, hey, something's wrong. Something's not right. Just go before God. You can go before God because his blood gives us a clean conscience. And without that, without that, we're going to turn to different tools we're not going to use the right tool set in our lives. His blood gives us cleansing of conscience. His blood also gives us forgiveness from our sins. That's absolutely why it's called Good Friday. Because there's this problem of sin. Hebrews 9.15. Therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant. A new promise, if you will. So that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. You know, we try to cover up um, many things in our lives. Um, I have this, I have this, this uh, sports coat or a, a blazer that has a stain on it. And it's a pesky little stain because it's a dark coat, but it has those bleach stains on it. So it's white. So it's, it's stained forever, right? I can't do anything about it. What I've tried to do, and I'll confess to you all, is take a little black Sharpie, kind of fill in the spots where the bleach stains are. And now I know that every Sunday, you guys are going to look at my sports coat and say, okay, well, where is it? And, you know, uh, I'm not going to tell you which one and where it is. <laughs> but after a few weeks, 
even though it's a permanent marker, it starts to fade. Wear and tear takes its toll on it. So I have to take it again, right? I have to take it again and work on it. Uh, a few weeks, oh no, come back. And it's a temporary fix on a permanent problem. My only solution is to get a new coat. From our birth in this world, we've all had that permanent stain in our lives. We've all had that mark, that sin that has marked our lives from the beginning, whether it's through the original sin from Adam, especially that we all have that, or a, a, a deliberate disobedience of God's word. We all have those stains in our lives. Sometimes we use the wrong tools to try to cover it up. For thousands of years, people have been trying to cover it up, and cover it up, and put permanent marker on there, but nothing is permanent. You require something new. Now, I can change my sports coat. I can donate this one to Goodwill and get a new one, maybe even the exact same one. But we can't change our souls. You can't go to the store and buy a new soul. You can't be reincarnated with a new soul and try to start fresh from somewhere else. We can't do that. It's a permanent stain. Jesus, through his work on the cross, did the miraculous change, taking us from being dead to alive. From taking that permanent stain in our lives, in our souls, and giving us new ones. Regenerating us. Making us completely new. We don't need to take those markers anymore and try to fill in the stains in our lives. If we try to do that by our own works, by our own power, you will get exhausted. You will fail. It might look good for a little bit. But you won't have the true liberation and the true freedom that comes from the forgiveness of our sins in Jesus. What they had been doing for thousands of years wasn't working. It was just temporary. It's kind of like student loans, okay? If you have student loans, right now it's a period of forbearance. You don't have to pay them. Because of the pandemic and everything, uh, the government has said that for this time you don't have to pay it. And your payments are in forbearance meaning we'll push it off for another time. They're not forgiven. Duam ne duh, right? <laughs> Can I get an amen? Uh, they're not forgiven, but they're forbeared. We'll kick the can down the road. We'll deal with it later. But they're not completely forgiven. That's what was happening for thousands of years. God said, we will take care of this problem, but not now. At a time and place of God's choosing, Jesus came into this earth prophesied for thousands of years. And at a time, Jesus went into Jerusalem. And up until then, remember, he told his disciples, the time has not yet come. Not yet. Almost there. He chose that time where society and culture and religion was coming together in a way that would spread like wildfire after his death, burial, and resurrection. The news of it was spread so fast that it wouldn't have been able to to spread as fast as it did hundreds or maybe even a few decades before. He chose in his right time to do it. Because now was a time for forgiveness. And he gave us a new covenant, a new promise. Jesus was the real thing. He wasn't just a copy. He wasn't just forbearing forgiveness. He forgives. And Jesus, through his sacrifice, Hebrews 9, 16 through 17, for, for where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Here's another benefit that we have. And I want to ask this question before I, I talk about it. What was Jesus' will for us? He said a lot of things, a lot of things to his disciples. But what he wanted for us is found in John 17, verse 20 through 21. He says this, John 17, 20 through 21. And he's praying to God. He's praying to God the Father. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus had a will. Just like we have a legal will, 
and as we just read in Hebrews, but only takes into effect after someone dies, someone receives an inheritance. Jesus wrote down in that will, God, I want them to have a relationship with us. I don't want them just to be forgiven of their sins and they just leave them to their own devices, but of relationship with us, access to us. And this was the will of the Father as well. They're all in accordance with one another. This was the will of Jesus for you and for me, a relationship with the Holy Trinity, the Holy, the, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. To not just go into the tabernacle, someone else to go on your behalf, for Pastor Julian to go once a year into church and pray for you, but for you every single day to be able to come down and say, Abba, Father, here I am. Abba, Father, I need your help, I need your guidance. By the blood of the Lamb. Later on in Hebrews 10, it says, Therefore, since we have been washed by this blood, let us come with boldness before the throne of God. Not by our own devices, not by our own little tools to come before God with this, but based on the blood of Jesus, the real thing, the real tool that made this happen. And on Good Friday, Jesus provided a way for direct, permanent, access to God. The veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place was ripped in two from the top down, not from the bottom up, symbolizing that relationship with God was now possible through the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ, through the perfect tool that made this happen. One last assurance that we have Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. I'm sorry, Hebrews 9, 27 through 28. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. There is no way that the blood of an animal, of a temporary animal, could provide eternal salvation. Couldn't happen. Jesus is coming back, amen. He's coming back, not to die again, not to be on the cross again, but to finish what he started. To take those back that have placed their faith in his sacrifice done on that cross. Good Friday is good because we have that promise of eternal salvation. That we will have that eternal unity with the triune God forever and ever. I'm not going to say forever, it's out of time, it's just... Timeless. And how many times do we forget these things, though, these benefits? A clean conscience, forgiveness of our sins, eternal salvation, assurance of a relationship with God. This is the time where we can think about those things and remember them. That's why when Jesus instituted the sacrament of the supper, of communion, he said, do these things in remembrance of me. Because so many times we forget. We're humans, we forget. If I don't write something down, if I don't note it down, five minutes later, I might forget it. God gave the law, he gave the things to people, and they still forgot it. That's why Jesus wants us to come and remember what he did. And remember why this Friday was so good. Not because of the pain that he bore, but why he bore that pain. Not because of his humiliation and his nakedness and his shame, but because of the covering, the eternal covering that he gave to us permanently for our sin, for our shame. I want us to stand up and invite the team up here. We benefit every single day from the forgiveness of God, from his grace, from his mercy, the direction in our lives. We're no longer slave to sin, but free in the spirit. Do we realize the treasure that we have from Jesus? Do you realize the treasure that there is in Jesus? Have you been trying to fix your life using the wrong tools? Have you been trying to fill that hole, that void in your life with drugs, with alcohol, with relationships that aren't, just aren't holy, aren't good? been trying to fill it with media, with TV, with games? Have you been trying to fill it 
with gossip? Have you been trying to fill it with anything else except confronting the hard and real truth that there's a problem? There's a real problem. Everyone has it. You're not alone. Everyone has it. I certainly have it. Every day I'm reminded that there's a struggle between the freedom from Jesus and the things of my past life. I don't live in them. I don't go back to them, but there are times when they come back up to my mind. I have to remind myself that those things have no power over me. Not because I'm worthy, because I've placed the blood of the lamb over my doorpost. Not because I've earned anything or because I use the right tools. But there's someone who knew how to use the right tools. Let me show you what that looks like. I'm going to put the mic down for a second. Our tools can never accomplish what Jesus accomplished on the cross, ever. We've been doing it wrong. They're just a symbol of what's to come, pointing to greater truth. What do you think of when you look at the cross? Because to the world is a symbol of shame, but to Christians it's a symbol of hope. We could have never done what Jesus did on the cross. Do we place our fears and our sins at the foot of this cross or do we run away I said earlier that we talk a little bit more about the scapegoat here's what happens there are two goats one of them will be slaughtered and one of them the priest will lay his hand symbolically put all the sins of the nation on this goat and then the goat will be sent away never to be seen again never to come back again to the camp can you imagine how some of the people might have thought though of oh my goodness what would happen if this goat came back with its sins it was just another reminder that that forgiveness was temporary Jesus fulfilled Along with being the Passover lamb of God, he fulfilled the roles of both of those goats. He was the blood that was slaughtered. And all the sins of the world were placed on him. And our sins, too, were placed on him. And scripture says that our sins were cast as far as the east is from the west, not to be brought up again. If you're struggling with this idea of salvation, of trying to earn something or trying to be better before you come to the cross, let me remind you that you don't go to the hospital when, when you're healthy. You go when you're sick. You don't wait until you start feeling better to go to the hospital. You go because you need help right now. This is the moment to do it. This is the time to do it. And if you're thinking, how does this happen? What do I have to do? What do I have to say? There's nothing magical. There's no special prayer that you have to do. It's a lifestyle. It begins with a prayer, sure, but it's a lifestyle. It's a change of heart. And here's what you have to do. You see, on that day, the priest did the majority of, of the work, of the forgiveness work. The priest did everything. And Jesus has done everything for us. There's nothing we could do. But the Israelites had one thing they had to do, and this was commanded to them by God. He says, here's what the nation has to do. Humble your hearts. That's what he told him to do. He said, don't, don't rejoice, don't have food, don't have a festival. Humble your hearts. And believe, believe that the sins replaced on that scapegoat are gone. That's what we have to do. Humble our hearts. Try to stop, stop trying to fix it yourself with your plastic tools, humble your hearts and believe that your sins, as you 
truly bring them out and they're laid on Jesus, that your sins have been laid on Jesus and that he took care of it. That's all you have to do. Humble yourself. I want to ask if you want to make that decision this evening as we pray and as we worship to come up here, we want to pray for you. We want to pray for you. If you need to make that decision, that step of action, that step of faith in the right direction, this is the moment to do it. Not because you deserve it. No one here has deserved it. Because you trust that the blood that's put over your life has done the work. That it can save you. That it can take care of that nasty problem. That can take care of that suffering in your life. If that's you in this evening, again, I'd just like to invite you as we're praying worship to come up here. We'll pray for you. You can give your life to Jesus and say, Lord, it's not mine. I want you to take care of it. And based on his word, based on what we just read, we come with boldness before the throne of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's his power that has done everything. It's his work that has done everything. Humble your heart in this evening. Come before the Lord. Seek him. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. Let's pray and worship.